The first great awakening. The first, the, the first great awakening occurred in the colonies because many of the older generation believed that liberalness in religion was beginning to permeate communities all throughout the country. Um, never have we been, and I've made this statement before, as religious as we were in this country when the Puritans arrived in 1630. Uh, with their Puritan religion would later become the Congregational Church. But as we talked about earlier, previous chapter, is that over time, um, there, were, there was a stratification in the uh, belief system. You had at the oldest generations being the most religious, and, that, and then every generation after that was less and less religious over time. That's just continued. However, there's been a, times in history when, as a country, we have gotten more religious. And one of those was the Great Awakening. And I call it the first Great Awakening because there's going to be a second Great Awakening about 100 years later. It's a time in history when old-timers, uh, re more religious people, dug their heels in and, and uh, demanded that people become more religious. Um, and in this first Great Awakening that's occurring in the 1720s and 1730s uh, was caused by this liberalness and religion and the, and the congregational church, the, Pur the old Puritans were, were frustrated because predestination was no longer be a thing. It was, the, it was waning, meaning it was going away. It was now being taught by many churches that good works could get you into heaven as opposed to divine decree. Divine decree would be God made the decision before you were born that you were either going to heaven or hell. That was the basis for Calvinist religion, Lutherans. That's what they believed in, and that's what Puritans believed in as well. But over time, started with the halfway covenant, people got less religious. There was a doctrine floating around called Arminius's doctrine that said that individual free will not divine decree would determine your eternal fate. Meaning if you did good works, that's your free will to do good works, then you, there'd be a place for you in heaven as opposed to someone who was say evil and they would be going to hell. So that's what that means by individual free will, your ability to make choices. Am I good? Am I not? Um, and that will, that will determine a person's eternal fate, much like Catholicism preaches today about good works get you into heaven. So that's what conservatives were very frustrated because of this liberalness and religion, and they dug their heels in and they fought back. And uh, the first Great Awakening was driven by preachers like Jonathan Edwards, who had a, a fiery speech entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, where he said that uh, the path to hell was paved with the unbaptized skulls of children meaning those people who weren't saved were going to die. Children would be dying um, and that their skulls would pave the way, the path to, to hell. Um, he demanded that people become more, more religious. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty fierce um, speaker was Jonathan Edwards. Once again, sinners in the hands of an angry God. There's a, a picture of, of, uh, a copy of his speech. <clears throat> Another uh, well-known Puritan preacher during this time uh, was George Whitefield. And he was, you know, had huge crowds that would come and hear him speak and he'd scream and yell. And uh, he really put emotion in, into uh, religion. And actually there is a, in, in Texas somewhere they have a, a a, his pulpit, one of the things he would stand up in that pulpit and he had his believers, those people that liked him. And then those people that didn't like him, but the old timers really liked him because he was trying to bring emotion back into religion and trying to bring spirit and try, back into religion and trying to get people more religious. This, the first great awakening is temporary. It really is. Did people become more religious because of the great awakening? Yeah, to a certain extent, but that also went by the wayside. However, what didn't go by the wayside 
were the effects of the Great Awakening. And in this class, in our United States history class, we're going to be talking mostly about the effects of that Great Awakening. And this is important right here. The first, the first one here, the first effect would be the first, it was the first spontaneous mass movement of the American people. It broke down sectional boundaries as well as denominational lines, creating unity in the colonies that eventually led to the revolution. We all know how difficult it was for the colonies to achieve any kind of unity between colonies, say New York and Massachusetts and Georgia, in order to fight off the strongest country in the world later on in 1776 they're going to have to come together. They're going to have to have some kind of unity to achieve that goal. And uh, this is the first time that something is happening all over the colonies at the same time. That's what it means by this first spontaneous mass movement of American people. It happens for us all the time. We, we celebrate Christmas all over the country, all over the world, really. Um, Easter, Monday night football, Super Bowl, World Series, NBA Finals, you know, uh, U.S. Open Golf, whatever. Everybody, people are talking about it. It happens. It's, it's unifying. Uh, people come to school the next day talking about games. They talk about TV shows that they've watched. Um, heck, how they dress similar to, you know, you look at the people who are, the way people are dressed in Salinas, California, juniors in high school and then in New York juniors in high school are wearing the same brands of clothes and whatnot. But anyways, things are happening all the time at the same time all throughout the country. That hasn't always been the case. As a matter of fact, this was the first time that something was happening all over the colonies at the same time. People were engulfed in this great awakening, trying to become more religious. So that's very significant. The other thing about the great awakening was the creation of new light centers of learning education became more important during the first great awakening um, training preachers became really important in the first great awakening princeton brown rutgers and dartmouth all were started during this period and they were considered to be what they called new light centers of learning there's princeton right there in new jersey there's brown university which is located in rhode island rutgers college in new jersey and dartmouth which is in new hampshire so yeah, new light centers of learning. So those two major, two major effects were really big in, in history and you need to know them inside and out. Okay, so we're entering a period um, in history as time goes on where schooling, art, leisure is gonna be more achievable. At first in the 1600s when we studied that period, people didn't have time to think about going to college or they didn't have time to paint a picture or uh, write a novel or come up with poetry, anything like that. But as you got more and more leisure time because of specialization, some people were building homes, some people were out hunting, uh, some people were teachers and, you know, professors and whatnot. Because you had more leisure time, it, it opened the door for things like school. Um, you know, schools were pretty severe and strict at the time, uh, but colleges, we've already talked about 1636, Harvard was open. Uh, Benjamin Franklin played a major role in the opening of the University of Pennsylvania, which became the first American college free from any kind of denominational control. By denominational, I mean any kind of religious. It wasn't a Catholic start, school started by Catholics. It wasn't a school started by the Congregational Church or the Puritan Church like Harvard was. University of Pennsylvania, known as Penn today, Ivy League school, first American college free from any kind of denominational control. Uh, I said two paintings. Uh, John Trumbull, pretty well-known uh, American painter. Uh, these, some of these uh, paintings you've probably seen before, the Declaration of Independence, the Surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown, and the Battle of Bunker Hill. If you haven't seen them, then you, do, you have seen it now, plus you're gonna see it later on when we get to the revolution. But John Trumbull would always paint himself in each one of these pictures. I can't remember exactly which one he is in any one of these paintings, but that was one thing that was significant. Painters will do that uh, to personalize it so there can't be made, copies can't be made. They would put themselves in it or their initials somewhere. Um, and he, he painted himself in there. 
Uh, Charles Wilson Peale was known for his portraits, and there's one of Washington, and there's one of Ben Franklin. John Singleton Copley uh, was another American painter during this time. Um, the, the most well known, his most well known would be the painting right there of Paul Revere, who was a silversmith. Let's talk a little bit about Benjamin Franklin. Pretty well known man in history. Is that actually was considered to be one of the smartest, if not the smartest colonists during this time. He loved learning. He was a scientist. Um, he read constantly. He actually printed, um, he, was a print, he, he ran a printing press and he came up with what's called Poor Richard's Almanac, which is the first, I think, like magazine, you would call it newspaper or magazine in America. It was a monthly publication and people couldn't wait to get it. It was just um, a magazine that had a bunch of stuff in it, everything. I can't even compare it. I don't know what to compare it to today, but it had sayings. It had um, do-it-yourself tips for around the house. It had recipes. It had um, opinion pages and local news of what was going on. Um, it, it, anyway, people just couldn't wait to get their hands on Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. Franklin's other contributions, proving that lightning was a form of electricity when he went out with his son, William, uh, and they went out and were able to prove that a lightning strike was electricity. Now, they did not get struck by lightning, but um, they had some kind of system that could tell if it was lightning. He invented bifocal spectacles, if you've ever seen them, like the line in someone's glasses. If they look up, you could see far away things. If they look down, they could see close things. Now we have what's called transitions and it gradually happens, but sometimes you'll see older people who like the line in the middle. Those are called bifocals invented by Franklin. The Franklin stove, which is a form, a kind of a wood burning stove. He urged uh, Philadelphia to have a library, free books to, that you could borrow. He was a postmaster, he was an inventor, he was a writer, he, was a, he was urged the city of Philadelphia to have a fire department and a police department. Um, so he did a whole bunch of different things. That's why they considered him to be the smartest man in America at the time. Uh, a new, a, a well-known uh, trial early in American history was the trial of John Peter Zanger. John Peter Zanger was a newspaper printer who was put on trial for criticizing a governor, the governor of New York, who, who was a royal government governor, which meant he was sent by the King of England to run things. He was charged with seditious libel. And uh, he, a jury found him to be not guilty, which was a banner achievement for freedom of the press. The freedom that our press has to print articles and say things about people as long as that what they say is true. Um, if it's not true, then they can't say it. But there's all, all kinds of rules about age and, um, and whatnot. But for the most part, we have freedom of the press. And that started here with John Peter Zanger, the newspaper printer who printed some things about a governor that a lot of people didn't like, and he was not guilty. And lastly, when it comes to the colonies, because the title of this chapter is, you know, the colonies on the eve of the revolution. In 1775, there were eight, eight of the colonies had royal governors, which meant that as a governor, just like I said before, the one that John Peter Zanger had criticized was a governor that was sent by the king to rule. Three had governors chosen by proprietors, like for instance, James Oglethorpe was a proprietor. Um, William Penn was a proprietor. So they would, the, govern, the king would say, you're in charge over there. Just, I don't really care too much what's happening, but you're, you're like the proxy king over in the, in the colonies. Almost every colony utilized a two house legislative body, which means they made their own laws. And then in those legislatures, like House of Burgesses was an example, self taxation, uh, with representation was something that they cherished, that their ability to tax um, themselves and then send their tax dollars to England. That was, again, another uh, something that was unique about the English colonies compared to the French. The French would charge taxes to their colonists and they'd tell them how much they had to pay. In the English colonies, the uh, colonial assemblies like the House of Burgesses would decide what the taxes would be and then they would send what they felt was a fair amount to England and England rarely would ever complain.
So yeah, self taxation with representation. And the right to vote was given to males, white male property owners at this time. And that comes from, as you know, the fundamental orders of Connecticut that those ideas spread about who should be, have the right to vote. It was not a pure democracy by any means. Pure democracy means everybody votes. So that is the end of chapter five.